Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you could all be here this morning. Uh, we have a nice worship service in store for you. We're so glad that the Handbell Choir could be with us this morning. Uh, and Sherry uh, accompanying us uh, on piano. And uh, thanks to Jeff uh, for being our worship leader. Um, let's see, a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, um, Wednesday night is the last of the ecumenical Lenten worship services and, and evening meals, and we are hosting it. Um, so uh, thanks to those who have already stepped forward to um, offer um, soup and uh, bringing salads, and, uh, but I'm sure that we probably could use more. I don't know if you, uh, if you would like to volunteer, talk to Jennifer Dimmer. Um, and uh, she, can <laughs> she can give you the, uh, uh, the details. Um, but uh, they, they've been wonderful. Uh, every Wednesday uh, during the season of Lent, uh, we have met at different churches and uh, at 6 o'clock had uh, shared in a meal of soup and salad. And then at 7 o'clock had a worship service. Um, beginning uh, uh, way back in uh, January uh, and early February, we were sure that we would be up in the sanctuary worshiping by this point. Um, and so we thought if we wait until the last of the Wednesdays, by, by, we'll certainly be there. Um, but of course, here we are. Um, so we will be having the soup and salad in the former preschool rooms and then coming here for worship service. And um, again, it should be a very nice evening. We've been averaging 45 or 50 folks um, for the meal and for the service. And uh, they've all been different, they've all been uh, uh, interesting and uh, really nice experiences. So uh, please uh, come on out for it. Uh, you don't have to have gone to any of the other services. Uh, they do not, uh, you know, they're not cumulative or anything like that. Uh, each one is its own separate thing. And, uh, but again, as we uh, close up, I'm sure that you'll uh, enjoy the experience. Um, so that's Wednesday night, dinner at six service at 7, and um, also wanted to lift up these um, that you'll see in the bulletin that there is a giving uh, opportunity. Um, if you would like to make an Easter donation towards one of the six uh, nonprofit groups that we support here in the community, you can do that in honor or in memory of a loved one. Uh, also, if you would like to give um, flowers for our Easter worship services, um, you can do that as well um, and help to make uh, Easter morning that much more uh, beautiful and glorious when we all come in and the flowers are all blooming here in the sanctuary. It really is a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful experience all around. And uh, so uh, also this morning uh, we are having our um, kids club and so um, following the playing of the handbell choir uh, for their special music, um, the kids will be invited to follow Jennifer Dimmer uh, over to those preschool rooms and uh, we'll have a kids club class. Uh, I'm afraid that unfortunately this morning we weren't we were unable to find a confirmation family to do uh, child care, so uh, all the kids are welcome to uh, go to, uh, to Kids Club this morning. Um, are there any uh, announcements or things that need to come before us before we begin our, our continue our worship? Uh, seeing none. Oh, one, one last thing. Um, so on. I can't remember if it was Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, um, I got a call from uh, Kristen Fluke. Kristen is the Lighthouse Youth Ministry Director, and she had received a text that was supposed to have been from me, asking her that I needed something from her, and uh, but I would not be available for a phone call, so if she would just text back, um, and it was signed Reverend Scott McLeod. Uh, because we have been corresponding with one another, she knew it was not me because she, it was an unidentified number. Um, but uh, she immediately called to make sure that I knew that there were scammers at work. Um, and she related a story about uh, one of Daniel, her husband, who's, who's pastor of the Christ the King Church, um, about one of his former parishioners who got taken in by one of these scams. Um, I called the conference office to see if they had like a best practices when this kind of thing happens. And uh, Jane Anderson, who is our associate conference minister, talked about like just the previous week, she had gotten one of these text messages purportedly from Franz Rieger, who's the conference minister. Um, so I just want to let you know that under no circ there are no circumstances in which I will contact you and ask for a monetary 
gift or donation or purchasing a gift card or you know like please know that that will never happen um, and if you get a text or email from me that seems even the, the remotest bit of suspicious or strange please call the church office do not what, <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to tell you this but if I ask you to do something for me don't do it <laughs> <laughs> But basically, it's, it's, it's come down to that. The scammers are really good. It's not that they've hacked my phone or they've hacked our email. They really, they will look at our church website and see what we're doing and use the name of one person and the name of somebody else and will try and make a connection so that you will follow up and follow through and be also, led. Down. Also, springtime is usually the heaviest season. It as is it well. really? So it should lighten up towards summertime, but now's the time where they're really coming out. Really? Yeah. I had I had I had no idea there were seasonal uh, <laughs> it is so seasonal it is right. <laughs> with the buds bursting and uh, yes, the daffodils coming out, the scammers are at work. Yeah. Uh, so, so just 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 so you know, we, we we felt it was not something that warranted like sending out a mass email to everybody. Um, but I just thought at both worship services this morning, I would just alert everybody that this is going on, and just just to be cautious. Um, okay, so that's all I have. Uh, let us. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Gary. One one elevator update. So ME9, the people that replaced the uh, the jack, um, were kind of backing away from continuing. Work on Gary. electronics that we found out. Well. Gary, I'm going to have you use so. so, NEI, who uh, replaced the jack, uh, backed away from uh, working on the electronics, which we have a problem with. So, on Tuesday, we have Otis coming back, and we'll see what they can do for us. So, continue crossing fingers. Few prayers wouldn't hurt, but um, at least part of the jack replacement cost should be covered by insurance. We don't know how much it's going to be depreciated, and of course the thing was 30 years old. So we'll see what what we get from the insurance company to help cover costs. Thank you, Gary. Thanks very much for letting us know. Um, if there's nothing further. Let's uh, continue our uh, worship service with our handouts.
Good morning. Good morning. Would everyone please rise in body or in spirit for the call to worship? <coughs> Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore, to teach Jesus the things of the deepest corners of your heart. Our opening hymn is number 24, the God of Abraham, praise in the new century.
the kids who are going to Kids Club want to follow uh, Mrs. Nimmer out. Our first reading this morning is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. If you'd like to follow along with the reading, it can be found on page 735 in the Old Testament. Jeremiah channels God's desire to have a closer relationship with all of God's people. The vision of a time when everyone would know God's word in their hearts. The days are surely coming, says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. It can be found on page 106 in the New Testament. Jesus views the arrival of Greek Gentiles to see him as a turning point in his ministry. It is, a challenge, it is a challenging message, losing one's life in order to save it. And with that word, God speaks. The crowd wonders if it was just the sound of thunder or the sound of angels. Here's our reading from John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip who was from Beth Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Here ends the reading of our sacred text. May the Spirit add to your understanding of God's holy word. Our sermon, What Should I Say? Father, Save Me. No. Let's uh, be in prayer together. Loving God, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this community of faith and the service of worship. Thank you for the prayers and the beautiful music. We thank you for the scripture texts. We thank you for the company and fellowship of our friends and fellow church members. We pray, God, that all these elements of worship, along with your Holy Spirit present to us, might help to shape and form and mold us 
that we might become more and more every day the disciples that you call us to be. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, uh, the text from, from John is uh, rich with uh, meaning, um, filled with a, a number of different uh, things that I, I'd like to talk about. Um, but this, the central issue is this, um, it's this riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, which is the, if you uh, love your life, um, you will lose it, but if you hate your life, you will find it. Or if you, if you seek to save your life, you will lose it, but if you lose your life for the sake of Jesus and the gospel, there you will, you will find it. What, is that, what does that mean? It's enough to kind of keep us, uh, um, you know, the gears turning for, for, for a lifetime, really, to kind of live out all that that implies. But I, but I wanted to talk about uh, um, this, this story from John, as well as touch on just a little bit the, the, the vision of um, a time in which uh, God's law, God's message, God's good news would be written, not on sheets of paper or tablets of stone, but in our hearts. Um, but let me, let me start with the, the John passage just a little bit. It's, it's important, this is an important part of, of the gospel because uh, Jesus sees the arrival of the Greeks as a, something important is about to take place. And it's because of what just happened previously. Just previously, Jesus had raised Lazarus. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And with that came great uh, acclaim from those who were, you know, powerfully moved by this miracle, but also um, it brought a lot of negative attention from the religious leaders of Jesus' day. In fact, it's, it's the raising of Lazarus that moves some of these religious leaders who already didn't really like Jesus very much, didn't really care for what he was saying, but this miracle actually moves them to begin to work towards silencing Jesus permanently. Uh, they are so um, upset by what has taken place, they even begin to work towards killing Lazarus. It's not enough to silence Jesus, but they also need to put an end to Lazarus himself. Um, so there is negative attention that Jesus has gotten by this miracle. There's also the positive acclaim. And so these uh, Greeks, Greek Gentiles, move to want to see who Jesus is. And, you know, part of the question is, what did they, what were they expecting from Jesus? Were they expecting uh, more miracles? Were they expecting uh, wise teachings? Uh, were they expecting um, uh, healings? Uh, were they expecting the multiplication of loaves and fishes? Uh, what were they expecting when they met Jesus? They probably were not expecting someone who would talk about dying in order to live and that seeking to live might mean the end of life that's something that you know it's 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 uh, again it's riddle what does it all mean so jesus sees this acclaim as you know that the hour has come the hour has come and so something important is about to happen but it's not what you expect. It's not the Messiah of power, the Messiah of uh, uh, liberation of Jerusalem. It's not the Messiah who is going to bring about, um, you know, uh, 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 the, you know, getting rid of the oppressive Romans. But this is a Messiah who's going to begin talking about something very different. Um, one of the other things that takes place is this, uh, this voice from heaven. Um, you remember that in uh, the transfiguration story, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have the story of Jesus being transfigured. His, his appearance changes. He's seen talking with Moses and Elijah. And it's at that point that the disciples hear a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now that story happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It does not happen in the Gospel of John. There's no transfiguration story in the Gospel of John. But there is 
this, in which Jesus hears this voice talking about, I have glorified your name, and it will glorify it again. Now, those who witness it hear thunder. Some interpret the thunder perhaps to be angelic voice. I'm not sure exactly what takes place. The other interesting thing about this passage is uh, when Jesus, you know, so Jesus has just talked about kind of his death, right? He's talking about giving himself up, that uh, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it's, it does nothing. But if it falls into the ground and dies, then a great fruit can come from it. And then Jesus says, my soul is greatly troubled. But what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this that I have come into the world. Now, the reason that I find that such a significant moment, not just because of what Jesus says, but because it's so different from what, again, is depicted in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you remember the story from Matthew, Mark, and Luke of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, this is after uh, the, 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 the Lord's Supper, after he has broken bread and said, this is my body, and shared the cup and said, this is my blood. He goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane, asks his disciples to kind of stick with him because he's greatly troubled. And then he prays to God. He prays to God, if it is possible, take this cup from my lips. Jesus is asking God, like, if it's possible, let's do this a different way. Let's try, you know, isn't there like a plan B that we could pursue? But then he ends that prayer with, the, nevertheless, your will be done. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus seems seriously conflicted. In fact, so conflicted that really his first choice would not be to follow unto crucifixion. He's willing to do it. Whatever God's will is, he's willing to do that. But it's not his first choice. In John's gospel, Jesus is different. In John's gospel, Jesus almost embraces this moment. It is not a moment of kind of typical glorification where Jesus is going to receive some kind of uh, special uh, privilege or some kind of special victory. No, the glorification that is being given in this moment is one of being lifted up on a cross. The, uh, the empires, you know, it's the, the worst thing that they can do to somebody. The ultimate penalty. The worst way to die. That is glorification. But Jesus at this point seems willing to embrace it. I, I love that part because I'll tell you, there are times in my life when I need a strong Jesus. You know, when I'm facing my own uh, trials or my own challenges, uh, uh, I need a, a Jesus who can say, like, yeah, bring it on. We'll do this. But there are also times in which I need the Jesus that's seriously shaken, seriously troubled. Seriously, hoping that there might be a different way that we could get through this. I love that the Gospels preserve both of those stories. Because, again, you can kind of imagine a Jesus who does feel both ways. Right? A Jesus who at times would be like, yeah, we're going to do this. And other times would be like, oh no. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? The connection with the Jeremiah text for today about God's word being written on our hearts rather than kind of external, written on tablets of stone or pages of a book is, is about this, this central riddle of this passage about a, a God who says to us, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it, and if you seek to lose your life for my sake, you'll save it. Um, The typical way that I understand this passage, the way that I understand this is that 
Our lives involve lots of choices. And there are lots of things that the world says, the culture in which we live, the society of which we're a part, the country that we live in, um, says that this is what makes for a good life. You need to have a good car, you need to have a nice house, you need to have nice clothes, you need to have the material possessions, you need to be able to travel on vacation, you need, you know, it's like, it's like all of these things that we're projected to on the, you know, media, television, commercials, and things like that, all the things that are supposed to be of most value, that's the life that Jesus would say is false. It's those, those things that we can spend so much of our lives pursuing, so much of our attention, so much of our worry, so much of our anxiety are about all of those things which really on the grand scale of what makes a life worth living are really not that important. If we will say no to that life, then maybe we can get on with real living, which is the connections that we have with one another, which is the, the, the bonds of fellowship with our family, with our friends, with the people that we love and who love us. You know, those are the things that make a real life. Those are the things that Jesus talks so much about. Jesus says, you know, the, all that other stuff is not important. What's really important is the relationships of love that we have with one another and our relationship with God. That's what's really important. And so when Jesus says things like those who would hate their life you know, or those who would lose their life will find new life. I think that that's what he's talking about. The thing about the Jeremiah text, um, I was trying to think of an example for, for how, how, how could I talk about that. And uh, many of you know that I'm like a Christmas uh, um, and so the, the thing that I thought about was the movie It's a Wonderful Life. You're all familiar with the movie It's a Wonderful Life. George Bailey living in Bedford Falls. Um, throughout the movie we see, um, I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole plot, but uh, George Bailey has lived his life in Bedford Falls. Um, but every step along the way, his ambition has been undercut by the immediate circumstances of what was going on. Um, he wants to uh, get away and go to college. He can't. Uh, he's got to use his college fund to uh, help the bank. He wants to uh, uh, go on a tour of the, of the world before uh, getting married. Uh, he can't because another crisis comes up. He wants, uh, he and Mary are going to spend their honeymoon, but there's a run on the bank and now he has to use the honeymoon money to uh, fund uh, the bank. Every time he makes a decision, he makes a decision against kind of worldly ambition and towards helping the people that he knows and loves, towards helping the community of which he's a part. But the thing about the movie that's so interesting is that George Bailey kind of feels like a failure to himself. He thinks that he's a failure because he's not been able to do so many of the things he talks about. You know, he's very proud of his younger brother, who's a, a, a war hero, but he's also a little bit jealous that his brother got to go off and do those things. Gets to the point where he is going to commit suicide. It's a, it's the, you know, again, as the story goes, it's the work of an angel to kind of wake him up to the, the, the gifts that he has and the gifts that he's been given. Uh, so that at the end of the movie, when um, you know the bank has been has fallen short because his uncle Billy has lost uh, the, the the deposit money, and now the bank um, is under audit, and uh, they they can't find this eight thousand dollars, and um, the community rallies around him, 
community rallies together and everybody contributes money. It's the last scene of the movie. And uh, I, I hope I'm not spoiling it for you. A movie that was made in, I think, was it 45 or 46? So if you've not seen it yet, I, I feel I'm okay to spoil it for you. Um, so the community gathers together. They gather up all this money. Uh, they, they more than more than pay back the uh, the eight thousand dollar that's been missing. Um, and his brother, uh, the war hero, comes back to Bedford Falls, and uh, in the closing scene toasts uh, his brother. Um, says to you know to my brother George, the richest man in the world. I think that that's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about those who seek to save their lives will lose it, those who give their lives will find it, because George Billy had lived a life of that. What I would hope, what I would hope, and, and this is where the Jeremiah text ties in for me, is that I would hope, like wouldn't it have been great if all along the way George Bailey had known that the choices he was making were the better choice. That the choices he was making to, to give up ambition, but instead to plant himself in the community, that that was a good choice and not the choice of somebody who was a failure, somebody who hadn't spread his wings further. I think that that's what Jeremiah is getting at when he talks about uh, uh, the word of God being written on our hearts. Because sometimes even the good that we do, we don't even recognize it within ourselves. The good choice that we make, we somehow feel like, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I think part of having God's word written on our hearts is not only to inspire to us to make the right choice, but when we do make that choice, to know that it was the right choice. I pray that as we move through the rest of this Lenten season, as we think about our own sense of discipleship, as we think about our own relationship with, with one another, the people around us, and with our God, I, I pray that all of us might have that sense within ourselves of the important choices we make, the important commitment that we have to one another, and that God embraces each one of us in that. Um, Jesus promises his disciples that he will uh, be with them that all will be drawn when he is raised up. And I think when we have that word beginning to be etched on our hearts, we'll feel that power. Amen. Let's uh, share together our second hymn. Uh, I believe it's uh, Be Thou My Vision, number 451. Thank you.
Gracious and loving God, we come before you seeking your spirit to be a part of our lives. We give you thanks for the beauty of this day and for the gift of this beautiful time we have together. We thank you for the people around us, our family, our friends, co-workers, those we work with in groups and clubs and organizations. Thank you for the people of this congregation. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the talents and the abilities that you have given to each one of us. We thank you for gifting us with these things that have helped us to raise families, to earn a living, to build up the communities. God, we know that we're not always the people that you've called us to be. You set a path before us, and oftentimes we stumble and get lost. But whenever we begin to veer off track, you are with us, guiding us, leading us, encouraging us, helping us to get past the roadblocks and the dead ends. No matter how far off the path we get, you are always ready to lead us back. Your forgiveness, your love, your compassion are always gifted to each one of us. Loving God and the community of which we're part in our families. We know of folks that are in great need. Those who are recovering from surgeries and therapies. Those who are trying to get back to where they were before in their health. We know individuals and families who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. We pray that they might know your comfort, that they might be strengthened by the people who are around them. We pray, God, for folks all around the world who are in places of violence, conflict, places where food is scarce. We pray, God, for an end to the violence. We pray for renewal and recovery. All these prayers and so many more we carry with us, God, in the silence of our worship space, we open up our hearts and our minds to you. Hear us as we pray in silence. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Even when we're unsure how to pray as we should, even then your spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for human words. Hear us now as we share the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. At this time,
some of our ushers will receive the morning's offering. Let us give as we are able, according to God's blessings already given to us. Go into the world knowing that God's love and grace goes with you.